Chapter 1. A Timeless Beginning In the vibrant heart of 17th century India, the bustling marketplaces were alive with color and sound. Spices scented the air, and stories of love and heroism filled the ears of those who would listen. But there was one story, a true story, that would stand the test of time. Once, in the Grand Palace of Agra, lived Emperor Shah Jahan, a powerful leader with a heart passionate for his land and people. But what many didn't know was that his heart held a love so deep and pure that it would inspire one of the world's greatest wonders. The first time Shah Jahan saw Mumtaz Mahal, it was as if the universe had paused. Their eyes met across a palace garden filled with blooming roses. He, the prince, was captivated by her grace and beauty. She, in a noble woman, felt a connection she could not explain. The two spent hours talking, losing track of time as they shared dreams and stories. With every moment they spent together, their bond grew stronger. Their friendship quickly blossomed into love. Many whispered about their electric connection, saying it was a love written in the stars. As days turned into months, and months into years, their bond was unbreakable. They were inseparable. They danced together under moonlit skies and shared secrets in hushed tones by the river's edge. Shah Jahan penned poetic verses for Mumtaz, while she whispered tales of faraway lands. Soon, with the blessings of their families, the two were married in a grand ceremony. The entire kingdom celebrated, for they all could see the Umdeen love the couple shared. Yet, as is the way of many great love stories, this one too had its moments of joy and sorrow. Little did they know that their love would be tested in ways they could never imagine, and that it would leave behind a legacy that the world would remember forever. Amidst the luxurious halls of Agra's palace, there was a buzz of excitement. Shah Jahan, with stars in his eyes, called upon the kingdom's finest architects and craftsmen. He had a dream, a vision of building a monument so grand that it would mirror the depth of his love for Mumtaz. Imagine, he said to the gathered crowd, a structure that touches the sky, shimmering in the sunlight, glowing under the moon, a symbol of our timeless love. Can you see it? Vastad Ahmad Lahori, the most renowned architect of the time, stepped forward, his heart filled with a mix of excitement and nervousness. Your Highness, he began, to mirror such profound love, we will need to create something the world has never seen before. The Emperor nodded. Then let's begin. Days turned into nights, and nights into days, as Shah Jahan and Ustad Ahmad Lahori pored over designs and sketches. They envisioned towering minarets, grand domes, intricate carvings, and sparkling gem inlays. Each element was carefully chosen, reflecting stories of the emperor and his beloved queen. Mutaz, though engrossed with the duties of the empire and her family, found time to visit the design chambers. With a soft smile and the grace that Shah Jahan had fallen in love with, she offered her insights, pointing out the symbolism of certain patterns or suggesting the use of specific precious stones. As the design began to take shape, a model was created. A miniature Taj Mahal stood in the palace courtyard, capturing everyone's imagination. It was said that anyone who looked upon it felt a tug at their heart, sensing the immense love that inspired its creation. The people of the kingdom waited with bated breath, eager to see the real monument rise from the ground. Rumors spread of the grandeur that was to come, and many traveled from distant lands, drawn by tales of the emperor's ambitious project. But as with all great endeavors, challenges awaited. The path to building this heaven on earth was not going to be easy. Yet, with the power of love guiding them, Shah Jahan and Mumtaz were ready to overcome any obstacle. Chapter 2 The Architect's Dream In a humble abode on the outskirts of Agra, Vistada Ahmad Lahori was deeply engrossed in his work, sketching and envisioning architectural marvels. His hands moved with grace, bringing to life buildings and monuments that had previously existed only in his dreams. Then, one day, a royal messenger arrived at his doorstep. 
The golden seal of the emperor gleamed on the parchment he carried. Lahori's heart raced as he read the words, realizing he was being summoned by Emperor Shah Jahan himself. As Lahori made his way to the palace, thoughts raced through his mind. He had heard whispers of the emperor's grand vision, a monument dedicated to his beloved queen. Now he realized he was being chosen to bring that dream to life. Entering the grand halls of the palace, Lahori was met with the gaze of the emperor. Shah Jahan's eyes, filled with determination and passion, spoke of a love so deep that words could hardly capture its essence. This said Ahmad, began Shah Jahan, I have heard tales of your unparalleled skills and vision. I have a dream, one that needs hands as gifted as yours to be realized. Lahori, deeply humbled, replied, Your Highness, to be called upon to serve you and to be part of such a grand vision is the highest honor. I am ready. The two men, one an emperor with a heart full of love, and the other, an architect with dreams bigger than the skies, embarked on a journey of creation. They would spend countless hours discussing, planning, and revising, each bringing their unique perspective and passion to the table. But while the vision was clear, the path was laden with challenges. The scale of the project, the intricacies required, and the sheer ambition of it all was daunting. Yet, Lahori was fueled by the trust and responsibility placed upon him. He would often find solace in his dreams, where visions of the Taj Mahal would dance before his eyes, guiding his hand and spirit. This was not just another project for Lahori, it was a call, a purpose, a destiny that he was ready to embrace with all his heart. Sad Ahmad Lahori's days were a blend of inspiration and challenge. As he stood before the vast expanse of the chosen site, he imagined the Taj Mahal in its full glory, casting a reflection upon the serene waters of the Yamuna River. Every sunrise and sunset, he envisioned how the rays would kiss the white marble, making it glow with a heavenly light. Inside the palace's design chamber, a massive table was filled with sketches, tools, and miniature models. Lahori and Shah Jahan often huddled together, surrounded by a team of dedicated craftsmen and engineers. They explored the art of symmetry, played with shadow and light, and delved deep into the intricacies of Islamic geometric patterns. The beauty was in the details. Lahori wanted every corner, every arch, and every minaret to tell a story. He dreamed of gardens that seemed to stretch into eternity, pathways lined with fragrant flowers, and water channels that whispered tales of love and separation. One evening, as the golden hues of the sunset streamed into the chamber, Shah Jahan held a piece of pristine white marble, its surface reflecting the soft light. This, he murmured, is the color of purity, of endless love. The tad should gleam like a pearl under the moonlight. Lahori nodded in agreement. The choice of using white marble, sourced from the quarries of Makrana, was finalized. But it wasn't just about the exterior. The interiors would be adorned with precious gemstones, jade, turquoise, and sapphires, each chosen to narrate the tales of Mumtaz and Shah Jahan's moments together. However, translating the dream into reality was not without its challenges. The weight of the massive dome the precision required for the minarets, and the logistics of transporting heavy marble slabs were just a few of the issues they grappled with. But Lahori was undeterred. For him, each challenge was an opportunity to innovate and push boundaries. As days turned into nights and nights into days, the designs evolved, with each version coming closer to the heavenly vision they both shared. It was clear that they weren't just building a mausoleum, they were designing a piece of heaven on earth, a testament to undying love and unmatched artistry. Chapter 3 The River's Edge The Taj Mahal was not merely to be a building, it was to be a dreamscape, a realm where love and beauty reigned supreme. Such a creation demanded the perfect location, a setting that would match its majesty and enhance its splendor. Emperor Shah Jahan and Ustad Ahmad Lahori 
would often ride on horseback, exploring the landscapes around Agra. They ventured through dense forests, crossed open meadows, and climbed gentle hills, seeking a location worthy of their grand vision. One morning, as the two traveled along the banks of the Amuna River, they found themselves on a raised platform of land. The serene river flowed gently, its waters reflecting the azure sky above. Birds sang from the trees, and the distant horizon promised the beauty of many sunrises and sunsets to come. Lahori, with his architect's eye, immediately saw the potential. Your Highness, he whispered, imagine the Taj right here. The reflection in the water, the tranquility of the river, and the vastness of the sky. This place, it's magical. Shah Jahan, closing his eyes, envisioned the white domes and minarets of the Taj Mahal. He saw the reflection of the monument in the river, shimmering under the moonlit sky. A gentle breeze rustled the leaves, making the scene feel even more ethereal. This is it, Shah Jahan declared with certainty in his voice. This will be the home of our Taj. News of the chosen location spread throughout the empire. People from near and far traveled to the site, curious about the place that had captured the emperor's heart. They stood by the river's edge, picturing the marvel that would soon rise there, forever changing the landscape. Little did they know that the choice of this location was not just for its beauty. The river would play a crucial role in the construction, aiding in the transportation of massive marble blocks and other materials. The blend of practicality and beauty was the essence of the vision behind the Taj Mahal. And so, on the banks of the Yamuna, the journey of building one of the world's most iconic monuments truly began. The Yamuna River, with its deep history and spiritual significance, flowed like a silken ribbon through the heart of Agra. Its waters had witnessed countless tales of love, valor, and devotion. Now it was to become an integral part of the love story of Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal. As the construction began, the river's role became evident. It wasn't just a backdrop, it was a lifeline. Boats filled with shimmering white marble from the quarries of Makrana floated gracefully on its surface. The river, with its gentle currents, cradled these precious cargoes, ensuring they reached the construction site safely. But the river did more than just aid in logistics. Every morning, as the sun's first rays kissed the waters of the Yamuna, workers and artisans would gather by its edge. They believed that the river's waters had a magic of their own, a power to inspire, heal, and bless. Many would dip their hands into the river, seeking its blessings before beginning their day's work. Shah Jahan, too, found solace by the river. On evenings when the weight of his responsibilities felt overwhelming, he would sit by the Yamuna, reminiscing about the moments he shared with Mumtaz. The gentle lapping of the waters against the shore seemed to whisper tales of their love, bringing him comfort and strength. Lahori, ever the visionary, used the river's reflective quality to enhance the Taj's beauty. He envisioned how the monument's reflection would dance upon the water, creating a mirror image that would dazzle onlookers. By night, under the silvery glow of the moon, this reflection would transform the riverbank into a dreamscape, blurring the lines between reality and fantasy. Stories and songs soon began to emerge, with poets and bards singing praises of the jewel by the Yamuna. They spoke of how the river, with its age-old magic, had embraced the Taj Mahal, turning the monument and its surroundings into a realm of love and wonder. Indeed, the Yamuna River was not just a body of water beside the Taj Mahal. It was its companion, its mirror, and its storyteller, weaving its own magic into the tapestry of the monument's legend. Chapter 4 Precious Stones and Stories The vision for the Taj Mahal was clear, it wasn't merely to be a structure, it was to be a masterpiece, an epitome of love etched in stone. To realize this vision, the finest materials from across lands and seas were needed. The emperor's decree echoed through the empire. For this monument, only the finest will suffice. 
Shah Jahan's edict set in motion a grand quest that spanned continents and cultures. The Mughal Empire, with its vast reach and deep coffers, sent emissaries to the far corners of the known world. From the renowned quarries of Makrana, flawless white marble was extracted. This marble, known for its purity and resilience, was destined to form the Taj's exterior, ensuring it stood undiminished by time. But it wasn't just about the marble. The interiors of the Taj were to tell stories, not through words, but through the sparkle and allure of precious gemstones. Shah Jahan envisioned walls inlaid with intricate designs, patterns that would shimmer and dance as light kissed them. Jade from China, turquoise from Tibet, lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, and sapphires from Sri Lanka. Traders and craftsmen brought treasures from lands near and afar. Each stone held a story, tales of mountains, deserts, and oceans they had traveled, and the hands through which they had passed. As these materials arrived in Agra, the city buzzed with excitement. Markets and workshops were filled with artisans meticulously examining each gem, marveling at their beauty and contemplating their place in the grand design. Stad Ahmad Lahori took charge of ensuring the quality of these materials. With a jeweler's eye, he assessed each gem, ensuring that only the most exquisite ones found their place in the Taj. It was a task of immense responsibility, and Lahori approached it with a mix of reverence and determination. For many in Agra, the arrival of these materials was more than just about construction. It was a tangible sign of the empire's grandeur, and more importantly, of Shah Jahan's unwavering commitment to immortalizing his love for Mumtaz. In the midst of all this, whispered tales spread among the people of how each stone was not just a material, but a silent witness to love, a testament to the lengths to which one would go to honor a beloved. In the bustling workshops of Agra, where the hum of activity never ceased, there existed a guild of artisans unlike any other. The stone carvers, these master craftsmen, drawn from across the empire, held secrets passed down through generations. These carvers did not merely shape stones, they breathed life into them. With deft hands and an intimate knowledge of each gem's character, they could reveal the heart of a sapphire or unveil the soul of a piece of jade. It was said that they conversed with the stones, understanding their whispers and tales. Rashid, the most revered among them, was an old man with silver in his hair and stories in his eyes. He was often seen with young apprentices huddled around him, hanging on to every word as he shared tales of his ancestors who had shaped jewels for emperors of old. Each gem, Rashid would begin, his voice soft yet commanding attention, holds a universe within. Our task is to unveil it. You don't force a design upon it. You discover it. Young carvers learned not only the techniques, but also the philosophy. They were taught patience, for some gems revealed their secrets quickly, while others took time. They were taught respect, for each stone had traveled, seen worlds, and held stories. As days turned into months, these artisans worked tirelessly. Under Rashid's watchful eye, they transformed raw stones into intricate designs. Flowers, vines, and geometric patterns emerged, each inlay telling tales of love, nature, and devotion. Shah Jahan, during his visits to the workshops, would often pause to watch these carvers. He was captivated by their artistry, the way their hands moved with precision and love. Seeing the emperor's interest, Rashid once remarked, Your Highness, these stones, they're much like us. With care, love, and understanding, they reveal their best. The emperor, touched by the sentiment, nodded. For him, the Taj was not just a monument, it was a symphony of stories, emotions, and dreams. And the stone carvers, with their ancient secrets and unmatched skills, were the maestros bringing it to life. Chapter 5. Challenges and Triumphs While the vision for the Taj Mahal was grand, and its progress seemed to stint, the journey to its completion was not without obstacles. 
Both nature and man posed challenges that tested the resolve of Shah Jahan, its architects, and the thousands working on this labor of love. The Yamuna River, while it provided an ethereal backdrop, was also a force to reckon with. Seasonal floods threatened to inundate the construction site. Workers would watch with bated breath as the waters rose, praying their hard work wouldn't be washed away. Engineers and architects had to rethink their strategies, developing innovative methods to safeguard the foundation and ensure the Taj longevity. But it wasn't just nature's fury they had to contend with. Political rivals, envious of Shah Jahan's ambition and the resources poured into the Taj, spread rumors. Whispers of the empire's treasury being drained and of more pressing needs being neglected began to circulate among the populace. These whispers turned into loud protests in some quarters, challenging the emperor's decisions. Internally, too, there were debates. The Hori, ever the perfectionist, frequently clashed with other members of the royal court over design elements and resource allocations. Each disagreement, while passionate, was a testament to the deep commitment everyone felt toward the project. One particular challenge was the transportation of the massive marble blocks from Makrana. The distance, combined with the sheer weight of the stones, meant that traditional methods were often insufficient. Innovations in transportation, including specialized carts and elephant teams, were devised to address this. And yet, with each hurdle, the team's determination only grew. Shah Jahan, ever the pillar of strength, often visited the site, not as an emperor inspecting a project, but as a grieving husband seeking solace. His presence, his unwavering faith in the monument's purpose, provided the motivation many needed during tough times. Every challenge we face, he once remarked, is but a testament to the love Mumtaz and I shared. Love isn't without its trials, and neither will be the journey of this monument. These words, profound in their simplicity, resonated with all. They were a reminder that the Taj, even in its construction, was mirroring the very essence of love, facing challenges head-on and emerging stronger. As the challenges mounted, so too did the innovations. Necessity, as they say, is the mother of invention. For the Taj Mahal to rise from the ground and meet the sky, old methods had to be revisited and new solutions crafted. One of the most significant breakthroughs was in the realm of foundation engineering. With the Taj being built close to the Yamuna River, ensuring stability was paramount. A deep well foundation, filled with layers of timber, iron and bricks, was designed to bear the weight of the massive structure. This not only provided the necessary support, but also ensured resilience against the shifting riverbed. Then there was the issue of lifting and placing large marble blocks and the heavy domed ceiling. Traditional pulleys and cranes were insufficient for the job. Enter the innovative Tasia, a specially designed wooden scaffold. This device, reminiscent of the ceremonial Tasias used in Muharram processions, was adapted to serve as a massive crane. It could be maneuvered to lift, position, and delicately place intricate marble pieces with pinpoint accuracy. Artisans, too, made leaps in their crafts. New techniques in Pietra Dura, the art of creating intricate designs using cut and fitted, highly polished colored stones, emerged, enabling more detailed and elaborate inlays than ever before. The flowers and patterns on the Taj walls weren't just designs, they were masterpieces, each telling a story, each a labor of love. The brilliance of these innovations wasn't lost on the world. Travelers, scholars, and architects from distant lands began to visit, eager to learn and understand the marvels behind the Taj's construction. Agra transformed, not just into a city of love, but also a hub of knowledge and innovation. Shah Jahan, watching these triumphs unfold, felt a deep sense of pride. Not just in the monument that was taking shape, but in the people, their ingenuity, their spirit, and their unwavering commitment. The Taj, he reflected, is not just a tribute to Mumtaz, 
but also to the brilliance of human endeavour. The Hori too often remarks, every stone we carve, every challenge we overcome, we are not just building a monument, we are crafting history. And indeed, they were. With each innovation and breakthrough, the Taj Mahal was not only cementing its place on the banks of the Yamuna, but also in the annals of human achievement. Chapter 6. Artisans from Afar News of the Taj Mahal's construction reverberated far beyond the boundaries of the Mughal Empire. The tales of its grandeur, its purpose, and the emperor's unwavering commitment to its perfection drew attention from the farthest reaches of the known world. Realizing that the monument he envisioned demanded expertise beyond what was available within his realm, Shah Jahan sent out calls for artisans and master craftsmen to come and contribute to this unparalleled endeavor. This wasn't just to be a Mughal masterpiece, but a world masterpiece. Soon, Agra became a melting pot of cultures and skills. From the valleys of Persia, renowned calligraphers made their way, bringing with them ancient scripts and unique styles. From Central Asia, expert dome builders arrived, each with techniques perfected over generations. The Byzantines, known for their intricate mosaics, sent representatives, while tile makers from Samarkand brought with them colors and patterns not seen before in the Mughal Empire. The city, already bustling with activity, now echoed with multiple languages and was colored by diverse traditions. Markets brimmed with exotic materials, foreign foods, and curious onlookers eager to witness the fusion of styles and ideas. In the royal court, a council was set up to integrate these international artisans with local craftsmen. It was a delicate dance of merging techniques, understanding different cultural nuances, and ensuring that the essence of the Taj remained undiluted. Lahori, ever the orchestrator, found himself not just managing designs and materials, but also navigating the rich tapestry of cultures. The Taj, he once mused, isn't just Shah Jahan's dream, it's the world's canvas. Workshops turned into classrooms. Local craftsmen learned from their international counterparts, absorbing skills and sharing their own. A Persian calligrapher might be seen explaining the nuance of a script to an Indian artist, while a dome specialist from Central Asia demonstrated techniques to a group of eager apprentices. And in these exchanges, more than just skills were shared, stories of distant lands, tales of great empires, and legends of past heroes were exchanged. As the sun set on Agra each day, the silhouettes of workers, both local and foreign, could be seen sharing meals, music, and moments of camaraderie. The Taj, while still under construction, had already achieved something profound. It had brought the world together, united in purpose, artistry, and admiration for love's eternal power. With the influx of artisans from diverse regions, Angra transformed from a Mughal city to an international hub of culture and artistry. The narrow lanes echoed with multilingual chatter, vibrant bazaars showcased crafts from various parts of the world, and the air was rich with the fragrances of diverse cuisines. Fascinating friendships blossomed. Farid, a local marble worker, formed a deep bond with Aziz, a mosaic expert from Byzantium. They would often be seen engrossed in conversation, exchanging notes about their crafts and sharing stories from their homelands. Such friendships became emblematic of the unity that the Taj Mahal inadvertently fostered. Celebrations, too, began to change. Local festivals, once exclusive to Agra, now integrated elements from abroad. The Persian festival of Nauruz found its place alongside Diwali, with locals partaking in the celebrations with as much enthusiasm. Musicians from different cultures collaborated, creating melodies that merged the sitar strains with the haunting notes of the Persian setar. Lahori, witnessing these interactions, decided to foster this cultural exchange further. He established the Kala Kendra, or Center of Arts, a place where artisans could showcase their techniques, hold workshops, and learn from each other. It was an instant success. The Kala Kendra became the heart of Agra, drawing not just artisans, 
but also locals, travelers, and scholars eager to partake in this unique confluence. Shah Jahan, always a patron of arts and culture, was particularly moved by these developments. He often attended sessions at the Kala Kendra, sometimes as a silent observer, at other times actively engaging in discussions. During one such session, he remarked, This monument is not just a tribute to love, but also to the boundless spirit of humanity. It's a reminder that when we come together, we create magic. But it wasn't just art and friendship that flourished. Love stories blossomed, transcending boundaries of culture and language. One such tale was that of Mihar, a young Indian dancer, and Rashid, a tile maker from Samarkand. Their love story, filled with the challenges of navigating cultural differences, but bound by a shared admiration for art, became legendary, mirroring in some ways the larger narrative of the Taj itself. As the Taj Mahal inched closer to completion, it was clear that its legacy would be multifaceted. While it would stand as an eternal symbol of love and architectural brilliance, it would also be a testament to the beauty that arises when cultures meld, learn from each other, and together craft history. Chapter 7. A Monument of Love Years had passed since the inception of the Taj Mahal, and the monumental endeavor was now nearing its completion. The once chaotic construction site had transformed into an awe-inspiring structure, with the main mausoleum's white marble gleaming under the sun, reflecting the hues of the sky at different times of the day. Agra was abuzz with anticipation. Artisans, having spent years working tirelessly, were now engrossed in the intricate final touches. The walls inside the mausoleum began to come alive as calligraphers inscribed verses from the Quran, emphasizing themes of judgment and paradise. Persian poetry, which spoke of love and eternity, adorned the entrance archways, making the monument's purpose clear to any visitor. The Pietra Dura artists, with their collection of colorful, semi-precious stones, were meticulously inlaying floral patterns and arabesques into the white marble. The delicate work required a steady hand and immense patience. Each stone was chosen with care, ensuring that the colors complemented each other and resonated with the overall theme of eternal love. Lahori, often seen with rolled-up blueprints and models, was now more frequently amidst the workers, guiding, appreciating, and at times, even joining them in their tasks. The bond between the chief architect and his team was palpable. Their shared journey, filled with challenges, dreams, and innovations, had forged a connection deeper than mere professional association. But the most poignant moments were Shah Jahan's visits. Unlike his earlier inspections filled with a ruler's scrutiny, his demeanor was now that of a man seeing his heart's deepest desire come to life. He'd often touch the marble, trace the calligraphy with his fingers, and get lost in the labyrinth of patterns, as if communicating with the soul of the monument, and in turn, with his beloved Mumtaz. One evening, as the sun cast a golden hue over the Taj, Shah Jahan stood at the main entrance, his silhouette framed against the magnificent backdrop. He whispered, Mumtaz, can you see our dream manifesting? This is not just a monument. It's our story, our eternal bond. The workers, though engrossed in their tasks, felt the profoundness of the moment. They weren't just constructing a building. They were stitching together a narrative of undying love, a testament that would transcend time. The final touches, while they were about perfecting the aesthetics, were also about infusing the Taj with emotions, ensuring that every visitor felt the love story it embodied and left with a piece of it in their hearts. The day that many had eagerly awaited had finally arrived. Word had spread far and wide. The Taj Mahal, Shah Jahan's magnum opus dedicated to his beloved Mumtaz, was complete. Monarchs, diplomats, scholars, and commoners from distant lands had journeyed to Agra, eager to witness the grand inauguration of a monument that was already being heralded as a wonder of the world. Agra, once a bustling construction site, had transformed into a festival ground. 
Colorful tents dotted the landscape. Minstrels played melodies that drifted on the wind, and markets overflowed with exotic wares and foods. Children ran about with kites that danced in the azure sky, their strings perhaps trying to catch a glimpse of the Taj's majestic dome. Lahori, the mastermind behind the architectural feat, felt a mix of pride and nostalgia. Watching the finished masterpiece, he remembered the countless sketches, sleepless nights, and the resilience of thousands of artisans who had turned a dream into reality. As he looked around, he saw many of those artisans beaming with pride, their eyes glistening with tears of joy and accomplishment. As the sun began its descent, casting a soft golden glow on the tajed white marble, a procession emerged from the royal palace. Elephants adorned with embroidered cloths, horse-drawn carriages with silken canopies, and guards in shimmering uniforms marched towards the Taj Mahal. At the forefront was Shah Jahan, dressed in a regal robe with a turban that bore the imperial feather. But his grandeur wasn't what caught the eyes of onlookers. It was a profound emotion evident on his face. As he approached the Taj, he seemed to be walking in a trance, every step heavy with memories of Muntaz. The culmination of the event was a ceremony at the main entrance. Shah Jahan, with a heavy heart, but a proud stance, addressed the gathering. This monument, he began, his voice echoing in the vastness, is not merely stone and mortar. It's a testament to love, passion, and the eternal promise I made to my beloved Muntaz. Today, I share this promise with the world. May the Taj stand forever as a beacon of love and hope. With that, the gates of the Taj Mahal were open to the public. As people entered, many were moved to tears by the sheer beauty and the palpable emotions embedded in every corner. Whispered stories of Shah Jahan and Mumtaz circulated, turning the monument into a living, breathing tale of love. That night, under a canopy of stars, Agra celebrated. Music, dance, and laughter filled the air. The Taj, bathed in moonlight, stood silently, its silhouette a testament to a love story that would be told and retold for generations to come. Chapter 8 Beyond Beauty While the Taj Mahal's magnificent white dome and slender minarets captured immediate attention, the complex was not just about the mausoleum. As visitors ventured further, they discovered a realm that extended beyond the main structure, encapsulating equally profound beauty and purpose. The Charbar, or the Persian-style garden, spread out symmetrically in front of the Taj. It was an earthly representation of the paradise described in Islamic texts. Narrow water channels, representing the rivers of paradise, dissected the garden into four equal parts, with fountains intermittently breaking the calm flow of water. The gentle sound of flowing water, the fragrance of blooming flowers, and the fluttering of birds created a serene ambience, allowing visitors to meditate upon life, love, and the transient nature of earthly existence. Lush trees, carefully chosen for their symbolic meanings, dotted the landscape. Fruit-bearing trees symbolized life and abundance, while the cypress trees, with their slender and upright form, symbolized death and the path to the afterlife. Adjacent to the main mausoleum were two identical red sandstone structures, the mosque and the guest house, or Memon Khana. The mosque, facing the holy city of Mecca, provided a place for prayer and spiritual reflection. Its red hue contrasted beautifully with the white of the Taj, and on entering, one would find intricate calligraphy and quotations from the Quran adorning its walls. It served not just as a place of worship, but also as a reminder of the spiritual ethos that underpinned the entire monument. Opposite the mosque was the guest house, mirroring the mosque's design but serving a different purpose. While some believed it was built to maintain symmetry, others held that it was a space where scholars, poets, and thinkers would congregate, discussing philosophy, arts, and the profound mysteries of existence. Nilofer, a poetess of the time beautifully captured the essence of these structures in her verses. In the shadow of the Taj, 
amidst the green expanse, lie tales of life and death in an eternal dance. While the mosque whispers prayers of love divine, the guest house resonates with melodies and stories like old wine. For many visitors, these auxiliary structures and gardens added depth to their Taj Mahal experience. It was not just about celebrating romantic love, it was a reflection on life, death, the hereafter, and the eternal quest for knowledge and spiritual connection. Beyond the marvel of its architecture and the intricacy of its designs, the Taj Mahal resonated with deeper layers of meaning. It wasn't just a mausoleum, it was a spiritual canvas where art, architecture, and faith intertwined. One of the most striking features was the impeccable symmetry that pervaded the entire complex. From the main mausoleum to the surrounding buildings and gardens, everything mirrored itself with precision. This symmetry, though aesthetically pleasing, was more than just visual harmony. It symbolized balance, order, and the cosmic principles that govern the universe. The central water channel in the garden, leading up to the main mausoleum, acted as a reflection pool. On a still day, the Taj Mahal mirrored perfectly on the water's surface, representing the duality of life and death, the earthly realm and the heavens, and the fleeting nature of worldly existence juxtaposed with the promise of eternal paradise. As visitors walked through the main entrance, the calligraphy inscribed on the great gate caught their attention. O soul, thou art at rest. Return to the Lord at peace with him, and he at peace with you. This powerful invocation from the Quran set the tone, reminding visitors of life's ephemeral nature and the eternal rest and peace promised in the afterlife. Inside, the octagonal shape of Muntaz Zenitif, surrounded by an intricate marble lattice screen, held its own significance. In Islamic cosmology, the number eight is symbolic of the threshold between the earthly and the celestial, mirroring the eight levels of paradise. Furthermore, the place in the Shah Jahan's cenotaph, next to Mumtaz, was an exception to the otherwise strict symmetry. While some viewed it as a disruption, others perceived it as a potent symbol of Shah Jahan's undying love, choosing to be beside his beloved, even in death. Dr. Abdullah, a scholar visiting during the inauguration, mused, the Taj, in its silent eloquence, speaks of the unity of life and death, love and loss, the fleeting and the eternal. Its symmetry isn't mere aesthetics, it's a reflection of the cosmic order. As days turned into nights, the play of light and shadow on the Taj's white marble surface evoked different emotions. The soft moonlight made it ethereal, almost otherworldly, while the dawn's first rays gave it a rosy hue, embodying hope and rebirth. It was clear that the Taj Mahal was not just a feat of architecture, but also a spiritual journey, a pilgrimage of sorts. Every element, every design, beckoned visitors to reflect, to delve deeper, and to connect with something far greater than themselves. Chapter 9. Trials of Time. As the years rolled on, the Taj Mahal, that eternal symbol of love, stood tall and proud against the backdrop of the Yamuna. But the world outside its walls was in constant flux. Empires rose and fell, kings and conquerors came and went, and Agra, being a strategic and cultural hub, found itself at the epicenter of many historical upheavals. A few decades after Shah Jahan's reign, the Mughal Empire started showing signs of decline. The opulence and grandeur of yesteryears gave way to internal strife and external threats. The Marathas from the Deccan made their presence felt, challenging Mughal supremacy in northern India. Battles raged around Agra, and the city witnessed multiple sieges. One fateful day, tales reached the city's residents that a Maratha army was advancing towards Agra. Panic ensued, with the conquerors lay waste to the Taj, the city's crowning jewel. As the Maratha generals set up camp outside Agra, they were captivated by the sight of the Taj Mahal. To their credit, rather than seeing it as a mere asset to be looted, they recognized its unparalleled beauty and significance. 
The monument remained untouched, and the city breathed a sigh of relief. However, the Taj trials were far from over. The Mughal Empire's waning power created a vacuum that European colonial powers were eager to fill. The British, with their burgeoning East India Company, were consolidating their grip over India. During this period of transition, Angra once again found itself in the spotlight. The British, having heard tales of the Taj splendor, were keen to witness it firsthand. However, their appreciation was tinged with a colonial mindset. Many British officers took away precious stones and artifacts as souvenirs, stripping the Taj of some of its original treasures. Yet, amidst these trying times, there were saviors. Lord Curzon, the British viceroy of India in the early 20th century, was smitten by the Taj's beauty. Distressed by the neglect it had suffered over the years, he ordered a massive restoration project. Under his guidance, the gardens were relandscaped, the monument was cleaned and repaired, and the stolen artifacts were, where possible, returned or replaced. Ahmad, an old resident of Agra, often narrated tales of the Taj Begonera to the city's children. The Taj, he'd say, his eyes gleaming with a mix of pride and sadness, has seen emperors and invaders, admirers and plunderers, but through it all, it stands a testament to love and resilience. For the Taj Mahal, time was both an adversary and an ally. While the challenges it faced bore testament to its endurance, the admiration it garnered from friends and foes alike spoke of its timeless allure. As the decades turned into centuries, the Taj Mahal, with its brilliant white marble, began to show the marks of age and environmental wear. Pollution from the burgeoning industries in and around Agra left a layer of grime on the monument, while the changing course of the Yamuna River threatened its foundation. For a structure that had withstood invasions, wars and plunder, it was the silent and relentless march of time that became its most formidable challenge. Recognizing the urgency, initiatives began to emerge aimed at preserving this irreplaceable gem. Local historians, architects, and international experts convened to chart out a roadmap for the Taj restoration. The world watched closely, for the Taj was no longer just an Indian treasure, it belonged to humanity. Teams of artisans, many descendants of the original craftsmen who had built the Taj, were employed. They undertook the painstaking task of cleaning each marble slab using traditional techniques passed down through generations ensuring no harm befell the precious inscriptions or the intricate lattice work. However, cleaning was just one part of the challenge. The Taj's gardens, which had suffered neglect, were rejuvenated, restoring the original Mughal layouts and reintroducing flora that had once graced its paths. The monument's physical restoration was complemented by efforts to ensure its continued preservation. Strict regulations were put in place. Vehicular traffic was restricted in the vicinity to prevent pollution, industries were relocated, and a buffer zone was established to shield the Taj from urban sprawl. Tourists, while welcomed, were educated on responsible visitation, emphasizing the importance of leaving no trace. One notable initiative was the collaboration with international institutions to monitor the health of the Taj. Using state-of-the-art technology, Experts could detect even minor shifts or damages in real time, allowing for prompt interventions. The local community, seeing the collective effort to save the Taj, was rekindled with pride. Schools organized awareness drives. Local artists celebrated the Taj in their works, and stories of its past glories and challenges became popular tales recounted to tourists. In a touching ceremony, an elderly stone carver, after completing his work, whispered a prayer, May you stand eternal, O Taj, long after we are gone. May the world remember not just your beauty, but the love and effort of countless souls who cherished and protected you. Through the collaborative endeavors of people from all walks of life, the Taj Mahal was not just restored but reborn, ready to face the coming millennia as a beacon of love, endurance, and human ingenuity. Chapter 10 Whispered legends, the Taj Mahal was not just an architectural marvel, but a repository of countless tales.
Myths and Legends One of the most enchanting among them was the legend of the hidden chambers beneath the monument. As the sun set over the Yamuna, casting a golden hue over the white marble, bold storytellers in the streets of Agra would captivate audiences with tales of mystery and intrigue surrounding the Taj. Have you heard, began Rafiq, an elderly storyteller with deep-set eyes and a voice that echoed the wisdom of ages, of the secret tunnels and chambers beneath the Taj. A group of eager listeners, locals and tourists alike, gathered around him, their curiosity piqued. It is said, Rafiq continued, that when Shah Jahan commissioned the Taj Mahal, he had secret chambers constructed beneath it. These chambers, concealed from the world, held treasures of unimaginable value, jewels, gold, and ancient manuscripts. Rafiq then narrated the story of a young adventurer named Dipal, who, years ago, had embarked on a quest to uncover these chambers. Guided by a tattered map passed down through his family, Iqbal navigated dark tunnels, evading traps that had been set to deter intruders. But what he found was not treasures of gold or jewels, but rather rooms filled with artifacts, personal belongings of Mumtaz Mahal, and writings of Shah Jahan, offering a deeply personal glimpse into their lives. But Rafi's tale took a somber turn. When Iqbal emerged, he said he vowed never to reveal the entrance to the chambers. Some things, he said, are meant to remain untouched, their beauty residing in their mystery. As Rafi's story concluded, the audience was left in a state of wonder. Was there truth to the tale, or was it a mere legend? Some believed, while others remained skeptical. Over the years, many sought to validate the legend, with explorers and archaeologists expressing interest. Yet the Taj Foundation remained a well-guarded secret, its mysteries protected both by the reverence it commanded and the complexities of its design. For many, the allure of the Taj was not just its visible grandeur, but the whispered tales that floated around it. Whether fact or fiction, these legends added another layer to the monument's rich tapestry, making it all the more enchanting. The tales surrounding the Taj Mahal were not limited to its radiant white walls. Another legend, equally captivating, swirled around the streets of Agra. Was the tale of a twin monument, an ethereal mirror to the Taj, but crafted entirely in black marble, the Black Taj Mahal. As night cloaked the city, Naina, a gifted storyteller, would begin her narration under the moonlit sky. Beyond the magnificence of the White Taj, Shah Jahan had envisioned a twin monument for himself, a mirror reflection on the opposite bank of the Yamuna, a Black Taj as a final resting place beside his beloved Muntaz. She spoke of how Shah Jahan wanted the Black Taj to be a symbol of his own grief and mourning, a shadow to the luminous love represented by the White Taj Mahal. This majestic black edifice would stand on the opposite bank of the river with the waters of the Yamuna flowing between the two, reflecting their grandeur. However, as the legend went, Shah Jahan's ambitious plans were interrupted. His own son, Aurangzeb, fearing the strain such an undertaking would place on the royal treasury, placed him under house arrest before the vision could be realized. From his captivity in the Agra fort, Shah Jahan would gaze longingly at the Taj, perhaps imagining its black twin on the opposite bank. Nina's voice then took a melancholic turn. It's said that on moonlit nights, if you gaze into the Amuma's waters, you might catch a fleeting glimpse of the black Taj, a ghostly reflection born of an emperor's unrealized dream. Over time, historians and scholars debated the veracity of this legend. While some found references hinting at Shah Jahan's ambitious plans, others believed it was merely a romantic embellishment added over the centuries. A few even suggested that the foundations discovered on the opposite bank were initial preparations for the Black Taj. Regardless of its historical authenticity, the legend of the Black Taj Mahal captured imaginations. It painted a poignant picture of an emperor's boundless love and his tragic inability to immortalize it further. For many, the legend was more than a story. 
It was a testament to the very essence of love, evoking the dualities of joy and sorrow, light and shadow, fulfillment and yearning. Chapter 11 A Place in the World As dawn broke, casting the Taj Mahal in a soft golden hue, the world awoke to its splendor, not just as a physical monument, but as an eternal muse that had left an indelible mark on the global tapestry of literature and art. Ananya, a literature professor and art enthusiast, organized an exhibition in Agra, showcasing the many facets of the Taj as represented in creative expressions over centuries. It was titled The Taj, Through the Eyes of the Beholder. The first section of her exhibition was dedicated to poetry. Famous verses from poets like Rabindranath Tagore, who famously described the Taj as a teardrop on the cheek of time, were prominently displayed. Alongside were poems from writers across the world, each capturing the Taj in their unique linguistic rhythm and cultural context. The verses ranged from awestruck admiration to deep philosophical musings on love and mortality. Next, Ananya led her audience to the art section. Grand paintings from Mughal miniatures to contemporary canvases adorned the walls. There were depictions of the Taj under a starry night, during vibrant sunsets, or amidst the bustling life of Agra. One striking piece showed the Taj reflection in the Yamuna, with children playing by the riverbank, blending the majestic with the mundane. The exhibition also showcased sculptures, installations, and digital art. One interactive piece allowed visitors to recreate the Taj using virtual bricks, emphasizing the architectural genius behind its construction. As visitors moved through the exhibition, they encountered excerpts from novels, plays, and travelogues, each narrating encounters with the Taj. From tales of lovers meeting in its shadow to historical accounts of kings and conquerors being moved by its beauty, the narratives painted a rich, multifaceted portrait of the monument. During a panel discussion, Anani remarked, The Taj is not just stone and mortar. It's a living entity that has breathed through pages of books, rippled across canvases, and danced in verses. It's a testament to how art and literature can immortalize what is already timeless. As the day ended, visitors left with a deepened appreciation. The Taj was not just an architectural marvel in Agra, it was a global cultural icon, continuously reborn in the hearts and hands of artists and writers worldwide. The afternoon sun bathed the Taj Mahal in a warm glow, its white marble shimmering in the sunlight. Far from the monument, in a cozy corner of an Agra cafe, young couples sat sipping che, lost in stories of love, inspired by the grand testament of romance that loomed in the distance. Rohit, an aspiring writer of the passion for history, had initiated a unique event. Tales by the Taj. This gathering brought together couples to share their love stories, each influenced, in some way, by the iconic monument. The first to share was Mira, her eyes sparkling as she recounted her tale. It was during my first visit to the Taj, she began, lost in its beauty, I accidentally bumped into Raj. Our apologies turned into a conversation, our conversation into a friendship, and before we knew it, we were inseparable. We now visit the Taj every year on that day, reliving the moment our paths crossed. Another couple, elderly and with silver strands in their hair, narrated their tale. We were childhood sweethearts, said Sunita, holding her husband Ravi's hand. But life took us in different directions. Years later, we reconnected at a friend's gathering at the Taj. It felt like time hadn't moved at all. The monument, standing strong through the years, mirrored our love. Unchanged, unyielding. Young man, Arjun, took a deep breath before beginning his story. I proposed to Niha at the Taj, but not before taking her on a treasure hunt through Bagra, each clue tied to a historical tale of the monument. The final clue led her to me, standing beneath its grand dome, ring in hand. Rogat listened intently, jotting down snippets and occasionally wiping away a tear. The Taj, he reflected, isn't just a relic of the past. It's very much alive, shaping love stories, 
providing the backdrop to promises and witnessing countless moments of connection. As the evening approached and the gathering concluded, the participants left with a sense of shared camaraderie. The tales varied, but the central theme was unchanging. The Taj Mahal, a symbol of eternal love, continued to play matchmaker, sparking romances and rekindling old flames. Chapter 12 The Eternal Emblem The first rays of the sun gently touched the pristine white marble of the Taj Mahal, setting it aglow. Far from just being a relic of the past, the Taj stood as a vibrant part of the present, seamlessly blending its ancient heritage with the modern world. Sarita, a historian with a keen interest in cultural evolution, began her guided tour, emphasizing how the Taj Mahal had adapted and remained relevant in the modern age. As we stand here, she started, pointing towards the entrance, you'll notice the digital ticketing system and augmented reality guides. These have been implemented to enhance the visitor experience, making it both educational and immersive. Walking into the lush gardens, Sarita highlighted how the greenery had been maintained using sustainable and environmentally friendly methods. The flora here is maintained with organic gardening techniques, ensuring the grounds remain as enchanting as they were during Shah Jahan's time, but without the modern-day environmental footprint. As they moved indoors, Sarita's group was fascinated by the interactive holographic displays. These detailed the construction methods, the artisans' lives, and even allowed visitors to virtually meet Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal, giving insights into their legendary love story. But it's not just about embracing technology, Sarita continued. The Taj continues to be a hub for cultural events. She spoke of the classical music festivals held under the moonlight, the art exhibitions showcasing works inspired by Mughal architecture, and the yearly International Conference on Historical Preservation. Amidst the modern touches, what remained unchanged was the essence of the Taj. Its iconic dome, the intricate latticework, the stunning calligraphy, and the symmetry in design, all stood as a testament to its original glory. Concluding her tour at the banks of the Yamuna, Sarita reflected, while the methods of appreciation have evolved, the emotion remains the same. The Taj, in all its grandeur, continues to captivate hearts, bridging the gap between the past and the present, making history feel alive and ever-present. The twilight casts a deep azure hue over the Taj Mahal, its silhouette reflecting perfectly in the waters of the Yamuna. For centuries, the monument had stood as a beacon of love, architectural brilliance, and cultural heritage. Naina, a renowned documentary filmmaker, was capturing the concluding scenes for her film titled Legacy of the Taj. Through interviews, visuals, and stories, she aimed to depict how the Taj Mahal had influenced and shaped lives across generations. The film began with tales of the monument's creation, the devotion of Shah Jahan to his beloved Mumtaz, and the artistic feats achieved during its construction. But as the narrative unfolded, the legacy of the Taj Mahal revealed itself in more nuanced ways. There were interviews with couples from around the globe who had chosen the Taj as their wedding backdrop, inspired by the eternal love it represented. Artisans and craftsmen talked of how the intricate designs and techniques used in the Taj had been passed down, inspiring modern art forms and crafts. Academics discussed its significance in world history curricula, highlighting how the Taj served as a touchstone for discussions on Mughal history, Indo-Persian art, and historical preservation. Environmentalists spoke about how the monument's maintenance had pioneered sustainable methods of preservation, setting a benchmark for heritage sites globally. The film's most poignant moment came during an interview with a local resident, an elderly man with twinkling eyes, who remarked, For us, the Taj isn't just a monument. It's a guardian. It has seen empires rise and fall, calamities come and go, and yet it stands, reminding us that beauty and love endure. Nina's documentary concluded with panoramic shots of the Taj Mahal, transitioning from dawn to dusk, showcasing its timeless beauty. The voiceover, gentle and evocative, 
said, In its white marble and flawless design, in the stories it has witnessed and the ones it continues to inspire, the Taj legacy is itched. It's a legacy of love, of human achievement, and of the endless dance between the past and the present.